So good afternoon all and welcome. So how did we get here? Uh, it's just been an incredible journey these last uh, 12 to 15 years. You know, we've seen the South Korean music market uh, with K the K-pop idol world taking the reins, become a global leader, become the number six music market in the world. Well, it's a long story with many foundations laid and influences welcome over the many years. My name is Mike Wheeler, and I've been a K-pop super fan for a decade. A quick introduction. First on interpretations, there are endless ways to tell these stories. I hope to be welcoming to my interpretation. Time jumping. As we go through the years, I'm going to uh, jump ahead decades to the present day and look at some videos for similarities and comparisons. While we're also covering some concepts and genres, I hope it's not too jarring, but I think it'll keep things fresh and interesting for you. Regarding speaking edit edits, there are a couple of videos here of people speaking. They're very heavily edited. I did not make those edits, uh, the producers did. I did not change anything here to try and achieve any sort of bias. On uh, clip length, there are almost 40 clips in the session, many, some of them multi-segmented, uh, but they're only about 20 seconds to 50 seconds each, so you'll get a good taste of some things, but we'll keep moving. And I tried to you know, be equal in covering the boy and the girl groups, though it's difficult with the sales disparities, um, but also try to include a lot of uh, co-ed groups as well. So we saw elements of pop music in Korea in the earlier 1900s during the Japanese occupation, but we'll touch on that later. Let's start with some similarities we see today, the popularity of Western covers in K-pop. It was the Korean War, a horrifying moment in history, it was a time of survival, and survival requires ingenuity. The Kim sisters, very young at the time, would work with their family to obtain records off the black market. They would, they would obtain records of Western artists, which they would then work to copy, to mimic, to cover Western artists. Following, uh, during the war, they would perform for the Allied forces, which often gave them alcohol as payment. They would then tra trade the alcohol for rice to feed their large family. Following the war in 1958, following the war in 1958, an American producer would visit and see the group. He would bring them back stateside where they would stay active in some form for decades. Performing Little Anthony and the Imperials, which was a rock and roll hall of fame group, performing their song Going Out of My Head, here the Kim sisters on the Hollywood Palace. fantastically talented group. They were wonderful instrumentalists as well. And several sisters type groups would follow, but none would achieve the same level of fame. And though the Kim sisters, Kim sisters would release a couple of records in Korea, uh, they remain relatively unknown there. A quick moment on purification and censorship. In 1975 in Korea, we saw the purification of popular music measures passed. This banned the hybridization of K-pop and Western music. This also greatly intimidated people from performing such pieces live, any sort of live performance. It also would steer the broadcast of music program companies for decades. In 1987, with the June struggle, we saw the first democratic elections and the ban was removed. With the upcoming 1998 Seoul Olympics, or 1988, sorry, Seoul Olympics, ties strengthened with the West. Most importantly for K-pop today, the radio broadcasting of Western music would expand rapidly and widely. Censorship of various forms continues to, to today, and we'll touch on that a bit. 
here's what the uh, uh, Summer Olympic site looks like today. Most of the news are still in the Bowie area. So let's talk about the genres of retro and intro, uh, focusing here on the late 1980s. Bilingual group Coriola debuted in 1962 and remained active into the 1990s. With the removal of that band, band all their songs in the 1988 Hand in Hand album, which included the theme song for the Summer Olympics that year, were produced by none other than Giorgio Moroder. If you don't know who Giorgio is, he pioneered the use of the synthesizer in music, which you know, became the sound of the late 70s and the 80s. His contributions to disco and electronic dance music cannot be understated. They are very significant. He is often called the father or godfather of each. A B-side on a hand hand album by Coriana, Here's Stay, produced by Giorgio Moroder. It would become popular again during the pandemic era with the coining of the term neutro, which was uh, joining the words retro and new. And with neutro, we saw songs like JYD and Sumi's with the disco and BTS's Dynamite. And I think it was just a day or a few days ago that BTS's Dynamite became the first K pop song to enter the Spotify top 100 screen of all time. So let's look at a significant neutro song from 2000. The ending chorus that never closed La Di Da. We hear that synthesizer in the 80s sap in the 80s style. We see that 80s aesthetic. And we even see the choreography include Vogue, which was popular prior to the Madonna hit. <laughs> The foundation had laid been laid before this sound was still very popular. In 2016, a still relatively unknown boy group would release a song I believe would have been very popular if they had released in 2020. This is a snooper of Platonic Love. <laughs> Some influences from Aha's take on me, which was actually playing in the lobby yesterday. One of the biggest songs in the West for the 1980s. And if you actually want to support a group whose Polaroid you can afford, super would be super. So, Idol of Interest. We're close to Olympics. There are no Idol groups yet. But would Korea even have interest in an Idol group? And to look at that, I think we need to take a look at the biggest Idol group in history, if not number one, number two. New Kids on the Road. 
1992, they would visit South Korea as part of their 22-month-long tour, featuring more than 220 concerts. There was great excitement around the visits, around the visit, which included TV appearances and a press conference. Let's take a look at the day of the concert. We see how the music transcends boundaries, and we can even see some of the beginnings of the fandoms of today. <laughs> press conference of the visit, uh, founding member Donnie Walver would say something uh, that was very surprising to me and almost prophetic than what we see with our K-pop idol groups today. He described what it's, he describes what it's like to be an idol group seven to eight years into your history. And if you're a follower of K-pop, you know we have the seven-year curse, which we have a seven-year max contract length, and we see many group retirements, group disbandments, departures, etc. So let's see what Donnie has to say about that. Before the war, uh, knowing whether or not this is the last album, I think the, the, the great thing about this album is that um, we, we've been together as a group for eight years, and uh, around the sixth or seventh year, uh, the pressure became very great for us, and uh, we really control of our lives and our relationships as friends and as co-workers became very stressed. So let's move on just a couple of years to the modern era. And some people say this is when K-pop began, that nothing that happened before, before this moment matters. I, I disagree. I believe K-pop is a part of everything that happened before, but those perspectives are very valid. So at the start of the modern era, it's not we're not to the idol groups yet, but the first major K-pop group, South Haji and the Boys. And on the far right, that is Jung Hyun Suk, who in just a few years' time would leave the group and with his younger brother form YG Entertainment. On the Black Pink, Big Bang, 21, and Black Label, John So Me, AKBO, and more. Let's look at, take a look at their hit, Come Back Home. It calls for runaways to return home to their parents. It was a very bad issue in Korea at that time. And it uh, is understood that it helped a great deal that many uh, kids did return. The exposure to Western popular music that I mentioned that was expanding rapidly. With that, we see here a great deal of appreciation and reflection of hip hop and rap. <laughs> Taiji would perform this song in the years just before the pandemic, he would take a much different approach. He wouldn't compromise the music, uh, but he would soften his appearance and take more of a white idol approach. So the concept of genre switching. South Taiji and the boys had done genre switching and to great effect. But another group that was very influential here was Rua, the roots of reggae, I, I don't know. Uh, their 1995 hit, Angel Without Wings, or Angel Who Lost Wings, is a major hit even to today. You've probably seen some of your groups uh, cover this song. Uh, I feel this was very influential throughout the years. And here you'll see the genres of reggae, rap, some kind of Indian stereotypical type sound of light dancing, and uh, some pop music, pop vocals as well. <laughs>
genre scripting is a problem. This was us from the beginning of the modern era. And in the modern era, we still see a great deal of genre scripting, but we also see it utilized as part of storytelling. With Trialli's debut into the Luna lore, we see her display her ability to transfer from Eden and the first members of Luna into the realm of chaos, where she joins her eye uh, circle of Eden uh, with Kimlet and Jim Sol. Let's take a look at a clip uh, from that music video and then a reaction from a music producer who goes by form of therapy uh, regarding the genre switch in this song. <laughs> Listen, that's not how songs work. You can't literally change genres in the middle of a song. This song, I was gonna say, is like, oh, it's like such like it's such a it's such a sugary, like almost bubblegum pop, very lighthearted, very pretty song, and then all of a sudden it gets freaky and nasty, like grinding at the club kind of nasty, like no, you can't do that. I feel traumatized. And now form of therapy when he reacted to this video was just uh, responding to what his Patreons requested. Uh, in more recent years he has gone just about all K-pop, I believe, but I believe this was a genuine reaction at that time. Uh, we've, all, we've also seen drama switching and storytelling with TXT as a turn of it. And if you're interested in genre switching, you can look at uh, certainly the uh, most notable uh, Son of Shige's Girls' Generation, I Got a Boy, which is also, also often referred to as the Bohemian Rhapsody of K pop. Uh, but given, given its polarizing nature, I believe the Napoleon Dynamite of K pop may be a better title. So, Idol Inceptions and Fan Chance. Let's talk about the first Idol group. It's 1996. This is a true product of the SM Academy company, SM. And this video speaks for itself. We see so many things that we still have today. The color assignments, the names on display, the number assignments, the cuteness that I go. We even see our first ship form. This is HOT with Candy from their album, We Hate All Kinds of Islands. Right on. pieces of first fan chants during Tim Sun J performances uh, in earlier. Can't really play a clip of those though, they're very subtle. Uh, but with the uh, debut of HOT and Girl Group Think over the use of fan chants would rise. Uh, let's take a listen to one of the HOT early fan chants. <laughs> I can tell you it's certainly something to be in Korea in person in a concert and to hear and see and participate in the fan chants there. Let's go back to Japan where fan chants started, for an example. This is Shiny's Lucifer in Tokyo though, in 2016 at the DVD Tour. <laughs>
the first gen programs up to? First gen being the beginning of the modern era. Uh, besides your typical pop standards, there is a lot of R&B, similar to what was also popular in the West at that time. So this is 2000. Let's listen to Pinkles now and baby box with the trail. <laughs> There are certainly um, some Christina Aguilera, Jeannie and Molly influence there, which had come out about a year or a year and a half earlier. And at this period, um, some success, uh, even the successful fur groups would have trouble surviving. Um, file sharing would begin to siphon off some of the physical sales, and uh, there were no reality shows, or not many of them, and uh, not many advertising or promotional opportunities. So we're at the midpoint of the first generation and something has to give, K-pop needs to expand. It needs to expand internationally. And a child would have to break the first barriers. Debuting at 13, it would be soloist Boa, who would first carry K-pop into Japan. Also a product from the Essen Academy, she would participate in language immersion in Japan. Her Japanese album, Listen to My Heart, would be released when she was 15. It hit number one instantly. It was number 12 for the year. Six of the songs charted in the top 20. Here she is at the 2002 Japan Record Awards with Listen to My Heart. <laughs> So the genres of punk and future punk were still in the early 2000s. G.O.D. was a massive group, multi-million album sellers. I believe they still hold some physical sale records. They specialized in R&B, but did have a few punk tracks. I believe the punk genre, genre is relatively rare in K-pop, and people often stretch that genre to include more songs than they probably should. This is G.O.D. with Friday Night. <laughs> And Triple H would release a punk song as well or two. Uh, but first off, many happy blessings to the new engaged couple of Don and Kiana and Sir Gertrude Real Pew, which I was here. 
Uh, so another notable uh, funk song, uh, Triple H with 365 Fresh. <laughs> Future Funk is about giving Funk a more modern take. Here's Yoga Jingu, girlfriend with one of their more adventurous tunes, Fingertip. <laughs> About 2005 to 2007, and now expansion is going to happen rapidly. At the start of the second generation, in 2006 to 2007, these are the groups that would debut those two years. Some big names here Brown Eyed Girls, Big Bang, Wonder Girls, Kara, FT Island, and Girls Generation. Also, a note here is Sunny Hill, who is still active to this day. At this point, the South Korean music market ranked 30th. So this is 2006-2007. Let's take a look at the groups that debuted in 2017. Anybody want to guess how many would debut? Anybody? No. It was 86 groups <laughs> would debut in 2017. And while the soloists aren't listed, you can certainly extrapolate the growth there as well. Some very notable names here include Dreamcatcher, Ace, 101, The Boys, Will the Child, and more. As I mentioned, in 2007, the South Korean music market ranked 30th and now with rank sixth and has held on since. With the start of the second generation, it is time for the girl groups to rise. It is time for them to be able to grab some of the market share. And there are some wonderful stories you can tell here, but many of those are known. The Wonder Girls in their two year ultimately failed an influential uh, experiment in New York City. Girls' generation's massive rise and 20 months success in the last. But I wonder what other stories are there to tell. Let's talk about choreography and a new approach. Brown Eyed Girls felt the cute concept of the, of the time did not well fit their group, so they took a different approach with Average Dabra. To learn about the impact of the song, choreo, and poise for Brown Eyed Girls, let's hear it from an idol herself. Someone who lived it, someone who felt it, someone who was influenced by it. Ryu Sarah of Nine Muses, and then put the song. Brown Eyed Girls, Tarnay Girls, it is like part of K-pop history where women can look cool 
sort of the message was sent to the public. I, that's uh, what I personally felt, and I thought the the song and the choreo and everything, the confidence, everything was amazing. <laughs> This Corrigan, as Bugain herself, reappears four years later in one of the most successful k pop songs in history, Size Gentleman. The choreographer was Bei Yun Jung. She was paid four thousand dollars for the choreo for Brown Eye Brown Eye Girls, and eight thousand for the snippet used by Sonic for Gentlemen. BYG, as she is called, her choreography would lend an immense success to many girl groups, including Kara and Tiara. Here she is demoing a couple more for Girls Day in the MCD. <laughs> The XID's choreo would be banned for most of my performances. <laughs> it was deemed too provocative, understandably so. And what was to be one of the XID's final group appearances, they had not made money, they were not profitable, they just could not survive. An incredible moment. YouTuber Fan Campbell Corporal would capture main visual Connie performing this choreo. Uh, it's simply known as the Fan Cam. I'm not going to show a clip of it here. She takes it. A little bit further than I think BYJ even uh, intended. But at this moment, Tommy would save her group. They would reach number one a few months later. She would submit her career in the entertainment industry. And she would also set the foundation for our current fan fan culture, as the Oracle certainly played in the world. And now, even with every music program, we have every number of tracks, capturing numerous fan cams, overhead cams, everything you can imagine. And this is a day after these performances were held. Certainly, Tempest has been numbers here. Harpoon, uh, not yet debuted, but pre debuted per se. Uh, the Classy with 100, uh, you can see 20,000 views, so even the thing makes 160,000. So, this has actually become a contentious, contentious issue as these videos are printing money. So, the idols are wanting to cut, their entertainment companies want to cut, the broadcast companies want to keep the money, but their parent companies want the money. So, very interesting. Another important moment in the second generation. The inclusion. So we've not just talked about music, we've talked about fandoms and fan chants and choreo and now our physical sales. With Girls Generation's incredible rise and now at the top, it was time for their second album. Oh, and as said would make an incredible decision. They would include a piece of paper, the first randomized photo party. We had seen some inclusions earlier. Cool about a decade or more earlier with their square CD jewel case where they have square photos of the members included. And I understand TVXQ at one point had a photo card set uh, that was sold in Japan. But this was the first photo card in Korea and a first randomized inclusion. What started as somewhat, something somewhat innocuous has become some, simply staggering in breadth. This is Eyes One's third release, Blue Eyes. It came in three versions with more than 300 randomized inclusions. So now looking at the more recent years, focusing there, let's look at some genres. First, mainstream drama, and then something that's a little bit more obscure. Bubblegum pop has always been there for us. It's been there since day one with the elements of candy by HOT. But let's go back to 1969, and the number one song in the US, the biggest bubblegum pop song of all time, and an example from Korea for 2015. What evolution is there? With a great use of color, both of course in major keys, and both at 124 beats per minute. This is the Archie's Sugar Sugar 
and La Boom's Sugar Sugar. <laughs> And note in this clip about halfway through, there's some heavier, dark, low tones thrust in there. They add in rap as well. I think they do this to add in some essences of this masculinity. <laughs> My wife is very shocked when I showed that the first time. So, a more obscure genre, as I said, uh, let's look at the genre of Tranquil House, a subgenre of EDL. Tranquil House is about having more relaxing and uplifting sound. Instruments like marimba and steel drums, they're light, high, and airy tones, and it slows down a bit. It, it breathes well. Tranquil escapism is uh, the feeling you're looking for here. In their debut year, let's look at NCT 127's Switch. <laughs> Just after Hard with Ola Ola, and Car would make Tropical House key to their existence. Because they would make this their sound until, so they say, they couldn't afford the producers anymore. Remember, Big Matthew now produces their music for a much different genre. Let's take a look. <laughs> So, but where did Tropical House come from? Let's look at one of the first songs credited with starting an evolution towards Tropical House. This is by Scottish based musician uh, Uniform Kid, and the music video takes place in the Berlin Underground. Listen still for those high, airy tones, but also note the steel drums, which bleed through a great deal here. <laughs>
I have struck by house with a brawl, the tempo is slow, and the driving medium beats and rhythms of the fade. So let's look at the concept, the concept of dark idols. They've always been around, and especially the modern era, but Dreamcatcher made it a permanent approach. They utilize hard rock, heavy metal, more so in Japan, and EDM, and their music videos feature tales of nightmares. Another group came earlier and kept close to the permanent dark idol concept. That being Venice, let's take a look at their comeback stage for Voodoo Girl. Note the choreo with the impaling motion, that was not allowed later. <laughs> significant international popularity and sales. Others would certainly follow. Last year we saw Dixie. Researching early dark idol concepts, I found something uncomfortable, maybe. This was 1999, and it fits with what was popular in the West. New metal, new metal like Born, industrial metal like Rob Zombie, The Matrix would be released, and Hot Topic would be popular. Is Hot Topic still popular? I don't know. Anyway, regardless, they helped pave the way. This is HOT with I <laughs> They want artists of the year that year. So some uh, trends we see today, K-pop in public. This has always been important for us recently. Uh, public performances, including busking and the uh, Phantom Dance groups and Dance Challenges. Now looking at busking, um, East would actually be signed based on their popularity of busking and on day. We had seen other groups uh, bus beforehand, before or after debut, and uh, still just before the pandemic, we would see other groups like Saturday. Um, Ace includes four former trainees here, two from JYP and two from CJ, and as I said, this is before they were signed. Busking has decreased in Hong Bay and the Yongdong, I understand, uh, but some have shifted down the station to Xinjiang. K pop in the street, K pop in public, the K pop dance challenges, they have helped keep fandoms connected during the pandemic. Here's a very good accessible version. Anyone should feel like they can start enjoying such a group. This is AUG from Taiwan. 
uh, performing 101's Energetic, the 2021 model version. reality stage of sort of way. Um, the virtual concerts with that augmented reality aspect, uh, they were a great replacement at the start of the pandemic. Um, the stages were claustrophobic, they looked a little rough, the artists looked trapped in a box. By the end of the year at NAMA 2020, things would improve greatly uh, with the avenue of the approach stage right there. Um, utilizing a massive stage and elements of uh, augmented reality around that massive stage they removed the claustrophobic enclosures uh, of the road canyon performances. Watch here for the 80s performance as the camera pans above and below the stage, and you see an almost seamless transition with the augmented reality aspects. Uh, as I said, this is 80s with the high script, you know. So what are we seeing new in K-pop? What's to come? Uh, let's talk about a couple of crossovers. The first being the truck jump. And I mentioned at the start, we were talking about some of those elements of pop that existed in the early 1900s. And in the early 1900s, with the Japanese occupation, we saw them bring over Slave and Fox truck, and that greatly influenced truck, which is all about repetitive rhythms and vocal inflections. Uh, the younger generation in Korea and the idols have recently begun to grow their appreciation of trot music. And last year, we saw the first debut of a trot K-pop idol fusion group, the Pastel Girls. The four members on the left would actually participate in the contest show, Miss Trot 2. The member on the far right, Do Yoon, is a true trot trained singer. Let's take a look at their uh, song, Kyung Yo Shin Chong. Uh, where Do Yoon sings in trot style and the other four were singing in pop. <laughs> something with trot that's trot related or trot festivals and things like that we see their numbers feature in the tens of thousands. Another possible crossover that we're seeing is pop rock or pop opera. This has begun to make major inroads. 
I had first heard of Clara, heard about Clara in about 2013-2014. And I was fortunate enough that the last summer I was in Korea and I was leaving in 2013, they were performing in Incheon International Airport in the lobby. They are short of member here, and sadly they've been very quiet during the pandemic. I assume they are now done. But we've seen some uh, success recently with two boy groups, that being Forestella and Fortuna Quattro. And what's very notable here is Forestella has, has specifically stated they are taking the idol approach. They're working with other idols, they're streaming with other idols, they're marketing their albums and their merchandise in the same way. And it's working. They even have their own light stick. They went on sale on Monday. I know that because I have the order one for my mother. <laughs> For every operatic performance they give, they will also include a pop cover performance or a cover of a musical song or show number. So let's take a look here at Dalla Fantasia and our cover of that sheer in the shape of you. Itself, the perfect example of how you carry out operations, how you act upon uh, disbandment, how you carry out your disbandment, and I know from several very, very reliable sources in the industry that this group could absolutely not be in the same room together. They absolutely hated one another, I'm not going to say who it was, um, but they could not stand each other. But then now, in recent years, since their disbandment, we often see them get together for lunches and meals, and they, they warm. You know, I think a lot. It lends a lot back to what Donnie Wahlberg was saying at the beginning about what it is to be an idol seven, eight years in to live together and be around each other and wait for 20 hours a day. Yep. Um, for the last group, where did you uh, order the light stick? I want it. Uh, it's on withdrawn. Uh, Excellent. Yes, the only place it's selling. If you want the four stellar light stick, it's only on withdrawn. Uh, Excellent. Yes. Uh, in your opinion, what do you think is I think it uh, is really, that's a good question, I'm not too sure. I think it really harkens back to what happened where that radio broadcasting just expanded really quickly when that Western band dropped. And I think, you know, also South Korea becoming de democratic in that moment uh, began to associate itself with that sound of the West and other democratic nations. That could be my only guess. Uh, all the way back in blue. I think that uh, K-pop has a longer history uh, that I showed here today that's lended very well. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with the fandoms. And I tried to, try to show that through some like the uh, the fan chants and things like that. I think people associate it with having something they can identify with. And I've seen that a lot uh, recently in my life. I accidentally um, turned my mom into k dramas about seven, eight years ago that she became a K-pop fan. My sister fell in line. And then my mom's co-workers started following her. 
Um, and a great deal of those people have been in their 60s and 70s. And we see in Korea that one of the largest uh, key pop, uh, demographics is the, are those people over 65. Those people that were, you know, of prime age, right when K-pop first came out, in that modern era, per se, and then now today, you don't have that free time. And those do have done a great deal of that. I know I personally have always been pushing this stuff with social media, pushing it with friends and family, and I just haven't really ever seen that with um, C-pop or um, even J-pop. My only J-pop kind of interactions have always been at conventions like this, but K-pop always kind of fled in somewhere on its own. The day that I became, became a um, K-pop fan, K-pop super fan, the day from day one I was in, and from day one I was with my own bias group, that being so much today, girls' generation. Um, I was on one of the Kotaku family of websites that day, I can't remember which one, and someone was posting something about a new music video, and someone immediately commented and said, you should check out this new song from Girls' Generation in Korea. If for some reason I saved the video, I have no idea why. But I was working long hours back then, working an extra job, and I just meet. Yeah, I don't know, and I actually was going to make a comment about uh, that a little bit. Uh, I did mention FTI, and it is hard to not include the K bands here because they have had a significant impact. Um, you know, people have always said regarding Dreamcatcher why they've never achieved pop prominence and popularity domestically in Korea is that the Korean population is just not used to hard rock in any form um, or heavy metal. Um, but I think we saw a little bit of that today, like HOT's Idol was popular decades ago. It was a massively popular song, so it's just not true. And, you know, Insomnia's, the Dreamcatcher fans have always said it's just not a popular genre in Korea. But then, look at what Idol did this week. They released a hard rock song and they got a perfect all it. So it just, I think it just depends, you know, what just really resonates with people. Um, there are a few uh, giveaways up here, some uh, photos of TXT members Young Jun and Jun Kai, and BT's is sung off uh, if you want to grab stuff on your way out. Uh, but I need to wrap this up as we're at the D-Line, that's exactly it. So thank you all so much for coming. Thank you.